Welcome back, friends, to Kirby's Dreamcast, where we cover everything about Kirby, from the games to the anime to the manga and more. Kirby's Dreamcast. We're also the only Kirby podcast, so come to us for all the things, and we'll cover it eventually. Today I'm going to review Kirby in the Forgotten Land, celebrating everything the game did right, and acknowledging everything the game did wrong. Anything you agree and disagree with, you can let me know on the YouTube site's comments, or at Kirby Dreamcast on Twitter. By the way, the YouTube version will have gameplay footage in the background from when I LP'd the game, if you want to see the LP itself, there will be a link in the description. These reviews are only going to happen for the new games as they come out. All the old games get my full thoughts on them as I go through them, and 100% them when we do the full coverage episodes. You can see these reviews as a precursor to those full coverage episodes, because I'm going to talk about a lot more details than a reviewer normally would. I'm going to talk about the game from start to finish while pointing out certain points specifically. So these points I want to point out are the visuals and design of the game, like how good the game looks and works. The sound of the game, this covers music, sound effects, and voice acting. The gameplay, how good the game plays and feels. Presentation, this covers the structure of the game, the level layouts, the story, dialogue, flow, a lot of things. Basically, how do you the first three things work together and more? Accessibility, how welcoming is the game for newcomers, and how is it for returning players? And lastly, just extra is how I'm going to say it for points in that. What other things there are to talk about, but they don't fit. So why these six things are the things I'm thinking about? Well, they felt like they worked for covering everything about a game. For the most part, we experience a game through three senses. We see the game through visuals, we hear the game through sound, and we feel the game through gameplay. Presentation covers how these three senses work together to give us a great experience. Accessibility is something worth talking about in two contexts in any game series. One is how much fan service is there? How much does it rely on prior knowledge? Some game series are guilty of alienating newcomers. Fortunately, I don't think Kirby has ever been that way. That includes Star Allies, by the way. Arguably, there's other criteria I could use, but you have to make a decision and move on at some point, so that's where extra comes in. If I have anything else I want to say that doesn't fit the categories, then extra it is. Last thing to acknowledge before we start is obviously this is a Kirby podcast, so bias is going to be a thing, but I think no one is more critical of something than the fans of it. Just some choose to be more flowery about it. Personally, I don't like reviews by people who aren't fans of a series or genre. Usually they misunderstand something or dump on something to be popular or edgy. I don't find that useful. Hearing what a JRPG fan thinks of Street Fighter is worthless, is what I'm saying. Same thing like if you're a fan of, like, music games, you're not going to be the expert on JRPGs. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> but in the end, why does a review exist? So we can see what others think of something, and so we want to partake in that thing being reviewed. But also so we can discuss views on the subject as well. That's why this review exists. Obviously, as Kirby fans, we all bought the game, but let's talk about where the game succeeded and where it fumbled. Also, since this is a Kirby podcast, spoils coming up. So you start the game, and the first thing that happens isn't a title screen, no. It's the opening cutscene, and it is beautiful. Popstar has never looked so pretty. We follow Kirby as he's going about his day, riding his warp star, and then the sky goes dark and mysterious portals appear. The music changes with this, and we understand that something bad has come. Kirby gets a surprised face, and then he shakes the warp star to get going. We see Kirby fly around as many things get sucked into the portal, including Bandana D, who tries his best not to get sucked in. Then Kirby crashes and ends up in the portal too. As they're being transported, we see various objects as Kirby's body stretches out. Then we see him awaken on the beach. So right out the gate, we're treated with a very good cutscene. It's just a normal lazy day on Popstar, and then things go to heck. The music and visuals are in perfect tempo here, which is something I love about Kirby games. They're always good about this. And this opening song was done by... Hirokazu Ando, by the way, and it's called Kirby in the Mysterious Vortex. Hirokazu Ando is the lead on music this time around, with Yuta Ogasawara as lead sound, with Jun Ishikawa and Yuki Shimaoka as sound in general. There are 96 tracks in the game, all four on the sound staff are credited as composers elsewhere. Jun Ishikawa did the least number of songs with 13, but they're really good ones for what they are. Second fewest is Yuta Ogasawara, but they got to do a lot of the big memorable songs, with Hirokazu Ando doing most of the big memorable songs in his set of 22. The newest member, Yuki Shimaoka, composed a whopping 47 songs. They were tasked with doing most of the general level music, and they joined recently starting with Kirby Fighters 2, while Ogosawara joined at Kirby Star Allies. The future looks bright with these two new composers on the team, by the way. So from the opening, you're on some mysterious beach and there's no music, then you progress to a forest and you get forest sounds, and your first enemy is the new Awufi? It's a spooky cold build-up to the new area, where the world opens up and the music kicks on, and you are introduced to a whole new world. You could call this the Breath of the Wild shot if you want, 
They weren't the first ones to do this, but they did do it so well that people call it that now. This shot did exactly what it needed to do for me. I felt a sense of wonder as the music swelled up, and I saw this new land. By the way, this song is called Running Through the New World, and it was composed by Ogo Sawara. Everything about this first area feels like a kid discovering something new. The music is light and playful as Kirby runs and explores. It works so well! This is what you want a first level to be, and after some tutorialing through the first area, we find ourselves at the second cutscene. By the way, I forgot to mention Spring Breeze and Wild Mode. I'm glad this is a thing. They make the game easier for people who need it, and reward higher difficulty with more coins. I never found the game hard, but I'm sure it was challenging for some. So with the second cutscene, the music conveys this sense of wonder and curiosity to it as Kirby arrives at the car shop and looks around. Then the music amps up as three of Woofies attack Kirby, but then they're overtaken by the music of Kirby sucking them in. Lastly, he keeps sucking, and oh no, a car is heading for Kirby, and the music adds more playfulness to the tune as Kirby tries to swallow the car and ends up in mouthful mode, and the music ends with a surprise. Another great cutscene, amazing presentation. These cutscenes are so finely crafted, I love them so much. The music for the cutscene was named Mysterious Mouthful Mode and was composed by Shimaoka. A nice touch in the car section, by the way, is the music is slightly muffled until you break out of the car shop. These little details add so much to a game subconsciously. So let's talk about the first impressions of gameplay at this point. We've gotten a taste of Kirby in 3D and it translates pretty well. A big advantage to 3D is Kirby has more directions he can dodge, and on top of that, we get a new 3D dodge roll mechanic. Kirby has had a dodge roll for a while, but not one that caused slow-mo. It feels really rewarding to do a slow-mo dodge and then punish enemies with a bonus attack. And in the first area, you pick up Sword and Bomb Kirby, and they're fun, but there's a problem. There's no pause screen instructions. At no point in the game do you learn the full moveset of any powers. Blacksmith D gives you some information, but you never learn it all. This requires some experimentation, and to an extent, it's good to experiment, but it's a weird precedent for Kirby. As far back as Kirby's Adventure, the game series has always had the full moveset available for players to see on the pause screen. So this is a negative. There are kids still to this day learning moves that they had no idea were in the game, specifically with the sword powers, and that's unfortunate. Sword feels like it lost some of its combos, but they're actually there. You just need to use block and slide for some of them at the right times. It's unfortunate. While Bomb actually lost some of its abilities. Bomb hasn't been the most interesting power, but it loses some of its pep by not being able to plant them on enemies now. The evolutions help some, and we'll get to that later. Visually, both these powers look great and sound good too. The slash and boom sound good. For the most part, Kirby works well in 3D, but one last thing to mention is the weird limitations on flight. Kirby having flight stamina is fine, that's been a thing in games before, but what's weirder is the maximum height. It's even weirder when you can fall a great distance and climb back a great distance, but you just can't go any further. It's just really weird. Let's talk about Malfo mode. Malfo car Kirby. I love that he keeps his hat in the Malfo forms. That's really great. It's hilarious. Also, the taunts they do is very funny as well. Driving is fun and you can drift a little bit, which is great. Being able to break through walls in later driving sections make car Kirby a fun addition to the game. And then after this section, we'll get to the opener. Are you kidding me? Kirby gets an anime opener? It's amazing. It is a wonderful time. It is the first time Kirby's had a song with lyrics in the game. If you don't count like Susie singing. Some of Kirby's songs have had lyrics to them, but that's on the CDs. That's it. Never in-game besides, like I said, Susie, if you want to argue that. So this scene is fluid, colorful, and lyrics are so Kirby. It continues the momentum of how different this Kirby game is, but also how exciting this new game is. Tadashi Ikigami wrote the lyrics for Welcome to the New World, and it was composed by Ogasawara. I just, I gotta say really quick, just the surprise of it was so good, because in the demo, you did not have this opener. In the demo, you just drove through that road, and that was it. In this one, you knock down the thing, and then you get to hear the music, and then the cutscene happens, and that was amazing. Love this surprise so very much. It made me so happy. I think I teared up a little bit because I was so taken aback by it. Then we get the captured Waddle Dees and a destroyed area that will become Waddle Dee Town. And here comes the fourth cutscene, the capture of the Waddle Dees. I can't stop gushing over how good these songs are. The choice of the instruments in each cutscene is so good. You get this sense of desperation visually and also musically, with the Waddle Dees getting dominated and captured. The horns kicking in as Elflin flies for their life and the music taking a downturn as they're captured. So good! This song was composed by Hirokazu Ando and it was titled... Invasion of the Destroyed Town. Then Kirby rescues Elflin after an ambush arena fight. Quick fact, the developers used to flood you with enemies in these moments in earlier builds, but they felt like they were being too mean to Kirby, so they toned it down. 
So then you rescue Elflin and get the first Kirby dance. It's done very well and the addition of Elflin in the dance is great. Then we meet Elflin proper and wow they're so cute and fluffy and look at those eyes. Kirby gets a new friend every game and they always have great designs by the way and again, don't disappoint here. Elflin has a very cute fluffiness to them and those eyes are amazing, they're so glowy and swirly. Speaking of eyes, let's talk about Kirby's. In Kirby Star Allies, they were similar to Elflin's, they looked like they had little galaxies in them, with lots of little stars, but this time they changed how his eye blues work. Now they're iridescent, which means the colors change depending on the angle. Straight on, Kirby's eyes are blue, while from a side, they're a more blue-green teal. We can clearly see this in both of the first and second cutscenes. The Waddle Dees in the fourth cutscene show this as well, as their eye browns, they go from brown to yellow orangish depending on angle, so that's pretty interesting there. So from here, we get to see the overworld and see that we're in the natural plains, and the music for the world is what it should be. It's a nice little tune as you pick your level. What's nice is how the music changes as you progress through the world. The downtown grassland is great as it shows off more copy abilities and Malfo modes. The nice thing about Kirby games is how well they add more powers as you go forward and make them fit in the settings they're given. It's a very good slow drip method. In the second level, you get Cutter, Vending Machine, Cone, and Dome Kirby, and they're all fun to play with. We're also introduced to missions, and they're a fun new idea as well. Kirby games for almost 30 years have had hidden secrets for you to find or notice and get rewarded for. Missions act as challenges or hints, which works very well. I really like the search for hidden objects things. Kirby 64 felt like a big influence on the game with that. And partway through the level, you face one of the four sub-bosses, Wild Edge. His design is great. A big fur coat, tribal markings, and a meaner spike shield? Yeah, that's cool. The gameplay of this fight is a nice way to learn to use Cutter's Hold. And I think it's a valid criticism that there's only four sub-bosses. I like them, but we could have more, for sure. Most of the animal designs are pretty straightforward, but a great example of taking advantage of the setting is the Tortugas and the Tortildings. Big turtles encased in buildings? Heck yeah! A great creative idea and murdering them with Cone Kirby just looks powerful and kind of hilarious. At the end of the level, you get the Kirby dance with three Waddle Dees, and it is a wonderful dance. The Bandana D version is also great. An interesting new feature in this game is also that there's five different colors of Waddle Dees. They're not all just one orange. There are different shades of it, and I like that. You also get your first capsule at the end of the second stage. More rewards for keeping an eye out and searching every nook and cranny of the game. I like the addition of capsules since you can read them at your leisure, instead of pausing at every screen and boss fight to get all the lore. Getting the capsules in volumes makes sense since you wouldn't want to get spoiled by later capsules at early game, so it works out pretty well. Seeing all the Waddle Dees pile on a star after you finish a level is also so very cute, by the way, I love that. So the concept of Waddle Dee Town for the game hub is great. Getting rewarded for completing missions and rescuing Waddle Dees is an awesome idea. We love the Waddle Dees, they've been around for 30 years, and now we finally get to be friends with them instead of accidentally murdering them left and right. By the way, the song for Waddle Dee Town is a different instrument arrangement of the title screen song titled Ready to Go by Ogo Sawara. Through the Tunnel was the name of the third stage and the name of the song of the stage. This is the first Jun Ishikawa song, by the way, and introduces Dark Concepts and Fire Kirby. This is also where Stairs Kirby is introduced, which is okay. I think I'm okay with this power. It's slow, but they do puzzles with them, which makes them a little better. So after the third stage, they introduce the Treasure Roads, which are basically challenge modes for all the powers. I like these for the most part. They're all good except for Scissor Lift Challenge. That challenge punishes you really badly. It's the only one that feels like a misstep. Most of the challenges teach you how to be faster or more efficient with your powers, and I think that's great. The arena challenges are my favorite since they make you get good. So I've been pretty methodical up to this point because I want to get across how well I think they've done a good job of introducing the concepts of the game to players. So let's talk about accessibility. Returning players will easily transition from 2D to 3D, I think. And they'll enjoy how most of the powers translate to 3D, but they will be disappointed with how some of the movesets have lost what made them special. More on that later. I think the Malfa modes are fun and they get introduced well. The only one I don't really care for is Scissor Lift Kirby. They had some interesting ideas with it, but it's mostly just restricted and least interesting. The fourth level is Rocky Rollin' Road and it is my favorite Natural Plains level. It brings in Spike and Gun Kirby and I really enjoy both of those powers. They're really good in 3D. With Spike you get to roll around and pin a lot of enemies while Gun can shoot and aim well in all directions. Pretty fun. By the way, Gun Kirby is a pun. Kirby's shooting stars. <laughs> this stage also does something I think they could have done more. Back around the foreground 3D designs. In this stage, rocks roll towards the screen, and that just reminds me so much of Triple Deluxe. The best part being when you have to run from a giant boulder while running towards the screen. That was great. The weight of the boulder translates very well when it breaks through the ground. 
And by the way, this is the first Howl Room stage, if you want to find the Howl Rooms. And it's pretty well hidden, but it is findable. The fifth stage, Alival Mall. The song feels so Kirby and so 80s, it's perfect. Well done, Ando. The visual of the entrance is really good, and the mall itself looks very 80s. What I like most about this stage is Invincible Candy. That song is so exciting, and it's by Ogos Mario this time. They also introduced Wild Frosty here, and he looks feral. He is jacked. His fighting scheme is fine, and he gives Ice Kirby. And Ice Kirby sadly lost some of its attacks that made it special. Again, like Bomb, it lost its close proximity attack. Interestingly, though, Sword and Cutter kept their close range combos. But all powers with grabs lost their grabs, which was very unfortunate. I do appreciate that they kept the ice skating run, though. That was pretty cool. But there is so much to be desired, though. Mouthful Locker might be my favorite power since Kirby's so destructive with it, by the way. It's just hilarious. Same thing with Dome Kirby, by the way, from earlier. When he pops off and he's just on the ground, it's funny. Something I haven't talked about yet is the storytelling by the world itself. We've been running through a ruined civilization for about an hour at this point. There's shops, malls, and so many other things yet to be explored in these ruins, and it looks good. Good looking ruined city. Just seeing nature taking it back. Very cool to see that. I do like that you need a certain number of Waddle Dees before you can face a boss, by the way. Mostly because they're like Pikmin breaking down a wall. But it also makes kids take their time with stages to look for Waddle Dees instead of just rushing forward. Definitely a subjective like. So, Gorimondo. The lead-up to this fight is the best part. You get the slowly swelling music for the lead-up, you find a big pile of bananas, you know something big is out there. Then you get to the diner, and then Kirby freaks out. It's so good. He functions as a good first boss. You can fight him up close or far away, and he has lots of sweeping attacks, a grab, and a spin attack to learn from. Solid as a first boss, but also, like, the least interesting. His design is pretty boring, too. What can you really do with a gorilla, I suppose? But that's what they did with a gorilla. Just gave him that. That's it. <laughs> After beating Gorimondo, Blacksmith D is introduced, and I do really like the copy ability evolutions, but I don't like them as an excuse to cut down the roster of Kirby powers. I'll complain about it more later in depth as we go through this, but some of the evolutions aren't as great as they could be, or they just don't really do much with the power. Sword probably gets the most variety of all powers while being useful at all times, while Bomb and Ice suffer the most. Bomb gets more interesting with Chain Bomb, but Remote Bomb is way less useful. I like the idea of it, but it just isn't useful. The hats are cute though, really love those hats. Ice gets a cool idea of being able to make snowmen, but then loses in favor of big chunks of ice for the third evolution. And it's just not very interesting. It's disappointing, but I do like Blacksmith D. He's really cute, he's helpful to an extent by telling you some of the abilities, what they can do. And I just like, he's like, gimme, 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 when you show him a new blueprint. It's just great, I love that. I'll mention another disappointment now. Why couldn't we get an AI controlled bandana D for solo players? He plays really great in co-op, and he gets stronger as you get more blueprints, but the fact he's practically begging you to take him along really makes you sad. I'm not going to make that a ding against the game necessarily, because yeah, it's, it's to promote getting the other person to play with you, but having AI companion would have been nice for the lonely players. <laughs> then you get to Everbay Coast, and I like how it's natural plains, but with a more tropical feel, and them Jamaican drums, nice. The themes of each world in this game are wonderful. They're simple, but they did a lot with them. The theme for Everbay Coast was beach and water, and they did a lot with just that. By the way, Floaty Kirby is so cute. Also Floaty Waddle Dee. Also Sleep Kirby is back and adorable. So many cute things. Also the water looks great in this game, and that big crocodile is crazy big. Hammer Kirby comes back in the abandoned beach, which sounds so reminiscent of the first island's music in Kirby's long history. Hammer Kirby lost the ability to throw the hammer, unfortunately, which is sad, but the hammer sounds so good when you hit things with it and visually looks weighty in the hits. Also, Wild Bonkers is introduced here, and he's probably the least interesting of the four sub-bosses to me. Just Caveman Bonkers, and he's slow and easy to kill. Abandoned Beach also introduces Ring Kirby, which is a crazy idea. He shoots wind gusts from his mouth and acts as a blasting motor to boat around. I enjoy these silly powers. Concrete Isles introduces Digger Kirby, and it's an interesting idea for a power, but also weird. We had Animal Kirby, which was a digging power, and they didn't bring back that ability for some reason. Digging is an okay power, but they didn't do a lot with it. Pencil Sharpener Kirby looks funny later on, and the third evolution is stronger, but it's limited in speed and mobility as well. The only useful thing about the third one is, you can hurt enemies while you're underground. But the big thing about Digger Kirby is you gotta make that circle attack and that's it. Not the most interesting and not the most useful in boss fights. Crash Kirby also returns in the Concrete Isles, and as always, it looks awesome. I love Popat Kirby. That's what Crash Kirby is to me. Pipe Kirby is also introduced in the Concrete Isles, and that is a fun reaction time mouthful mode. I like that one a lot. 
The ending of the pipe run is hilarious every time, by the way. And after Concrete Isles, you're introduced to the Kirby Cafe, and the minigame is so fun! The lunch rush is amazing! I love the lunch rush, that cracks me up so much, that's pretty fun. Then the next level is Scale the Cement Summit, and it gives a good sense of vertical to the game, which I think was much needed by this point, we weren't getting a lot of that. Sure, it's a 3D game, but it's mostly felt like it was still just on the ground. All the climbing gives a great sense of depth, I really like that a lot. Kirby also faces for the first time the only new sub-boss, Florina. A ballerina swan that makes tornadoes is a perfect addition to the game. She's so elegant. Tornado Kirby returns here, and it's not that interesting besides the power and speed, and it just keeps ramping that up with each evolution. Second form is a cold tornado, and then a thunderous tornado with the final evolution. Flora Tornado is the cutest design, though. I like that a lot. Well, third is kind of cool looking, but that's about it. Certain Kirby powers are just not capable of much, and unfortunately the evolutions suffer from that too. Which just makes me think, maybe they should have had more powers? Also, this is the last copy ability. We got them all already. As much as I enjoyed the evolutions, 12 powers just feels too few. Also, just get them on the second level? Not great. Not second level, second world, of course. I also definitely miss having some of the mainstays like Beam and Fighter. Disc Kirby is also introduced here, and it's great. High Flying Kirby is a staple of Kirby games, and it's great to have it in here. Just about it couldn't also have like a shooting section as tradition, but okay, fine. Then there's Fast Flowing Waterworks, which is my favorite stage from the Everbay Coast because of how fast flowing it is. The water looks nice and avoiding the whirlpools is fun. And after that is of course the Tropical Terror, Tropic Woods. Though stationary, he's more interesting to me and more fun to me than Gory Mondo. Look at that big kahuna, and he drops coconuts on you and he spits big sweeping air guts at you, and those huge root tendrils coming at you. That's all very cool. A nice creative new idea is that he shields himself up as well by putting up a big metal thing in the way, and that's great. And then the later form of that Nightmare is even more fun to play with as well. Also, it's just nuts, we got another Wispy. So did a seed of Wispy fly over here or what? That's something that doesn't get mentioned, I'll talk about that when we do the full version of this, uh, not review, but over the game in the future. Time runs different between Dreamland and the Forgotten Land, because apparently when Kirby finally gets sucked into the portal because he took so long to get sucked in, it's been months for everyone else. So that's nuts, and I guess a Wispy grew here in that time. After defeating Tropic Woods, YSD unlocks, and oh my god, this is an interesting addition to the game. It just makes it more interesting. Learning how many Waddle Dees have been freed in the world at the time, how fast people beat bosses and such, that's cool. Every player, here's how many Waddle Dees have been rescued by every player. By the way, recently, one billion of Woofies have been killed in this game. As of this recording, they're past the one billion mark. That is ridiculous. How themselves use the word slaughtered, which is amazing. But my current headcanon is, it's always been Kirby just has the ability to poof them away, which explains why they're able to come back later on, because Kirby beats bosses and they come back anyway. So he doesn't permanently kill anyone besides, I guess, final bosses. What's also great is that he tells you if you've missed blueprints, and he gives you hints for that. That's very useful. That's a good accessibility thing right there. Happy with that. Speaking of Waddle D Town, Kirby's house is a nice touch. They didn't need sleep animations of Kirby and Bandana D. But oh my god, am I grateful they exist. They're so cute! Also, you get to look at other games that are on Switch, and you can look at kind of an achievement wall with the pictures on the wall, which is pretty cool. Wonderia Remains is easily my favorite land in this game. The creativity of a theme park is so fun. They did so many little touches to this place in general with all the rides and parade stuff, and things that make a theme park a theme park. I like the circusy touch to Natural Plains' song here as well. Wanderia starts with Welcome to Wanderia, and if you've been to Disneyland, it really gives that feel. You walk into the plaza, and there's the main statue of Wanderia, and behind it is the cardboard cutout for Kirby and Elflin to take pictures, which are really cute. Also, the Ducklings quest is there, and that's a very cute mission. There's food stalls everywhere, there's ticket booths, spinning spaceship rides, very much feels like Tomorrowland in this area, and then you get the roller coaster Kirby. This was an awesome addition to Mouthful Kirby's. Very much feels like Space Mountain at the point, the challenge of trying to collect all coins and buttons and not get hurt is a fun thing to do in this fast-paced section. Water Balloon Kirby also gets introduced in this stage, and oh no, he coming! I love this one too. This might be my favorite stage from the first half of the game since it introduces so many fun things to do. The Circuit Speedway stage is a big autopia, and it's a lot of fun doing the driving stages. Making time and trying to do better is a fun thing you can do. Then Invasion at the House of Horror stage comes up next, and the music here is Juni Shikawa. He likes doing the dark stages, he likes doing techno stuff, and you feel it here. And since we're in a theme park, of course a haunted house was going to happen, and I really like what they did here. You get jump scare cardboard cutouts, 
a dark area that requires light bulb Kirby, ghost enemies, and enemies that counter light bulb Kirby, so you can't just turn on the light the whole time. What makes the cutouts more effective is that they act as a roadblock and distraction, which forces you into fights, or that you have to be smart for the time being because the ground on you might give way, or platforms are moving around, which is really cool, I like these tricks. It is a very well thought out section. By the way, Time Crash Kirby unlocks around this point, and that is a fantastic idea for a power. The more you kill, the longer your time freeze goes. The hat is pretty cute. It's just like a Mad Hatter Kirby, I love that so much, it's just perfect. Especially when you think about what Alice in Wonderland, he is crazy about time and that, so yeah, it's perfect. Wow, I just thought about that. The last stage before the boss is Wondaria Dream Parade stage. Now, what I appreciate about Kirby is the variety of their stages they bring in everything in these themes. Natural Plains did different things in a ruined city. Everbay Coast did different waterways, and it continues here in Wondaria Remains. A good theme park has fast rides, gentle rides, fun rides, a haunted house, and of course, a light parade. Did you notice that the first stage was a bright sunny day, and then as you do each stage, the sun is further towards sunset? By the time you get to the haunted house, the sun is almost completely gone, and now it's nighttime. This is awesome storytelling by background. Let's talk about presentation again. They're doing this trick again. They set you up with a calm, quiet like they did at the beach and the forest. Kirby starts the stage outside where it's quiet and dark. Kirby progresses indoors and hits a switch, and then the door opens and the light parade is going! A different style of big reveal shot, and it's so good. As you progress forward, you get to see more of the parade and enjoy the merriment of it all. The beauty of video games is their ability to pull so many things together to give you a great experience. The visuals are dazzling, the music is cheery, and you walk through it yourself by controlling Kirby. It's really wonderful. The stage in general is fabulous, but something fun is after everything you've been through and having to avoid these unstoppable parade machines, now you can use Water Balloon Kirby to overpower them. Then they bring back the Boulder Run, but now you're avoiding a parade. So much fun stuff. The boss stage finishes off the theme perfectly. A big top! Not all theme parks have a circus, but some do, and the circus is pretty awesome to see. I like how she's waiting for you in her cape and hat, and then she throws them off to start the fight. What presentation. I really do enjoy Kalala around, she's pretty cool. The fight itself is fun, and what makes it great is that it's a dodge check stage. A lot of her attacks are overcome by being good at the dodge roll. You can of course just stand there and tank attacks too, but the dodge rolls are so rewarding. She's got a fun design with those Chun-Li thighs. Any running animal should have big legs. I like how she makes the big stage bigger by jumping onto the towers and throwing knives at you, and finally doing dive attacks. Great boss! Also her combo moves, very cool. After defeating Clawerine, the Colosseum unlocks and we know Meta Knight is in there. The Meta Knight Cup is fun. You get to do a boss rush mode with the bosses almost halfway through the game, and get rewarded with stars to do upgrades? The music in the locker room is good, but of course the big thing to mention is Meta Knight. His entrance is fire. This is very likely my favorite version of Meta Knight song. You do the traditional sword grab and then the music hits, and Meta Knight flies in and we get the sword clash and the music swells and BAM! The title! The Lone Swordsman Meta Knight. Perfectly executed intro. Then you have your fight with Meta Knight and he looks great and his attacks are awesome. The fact you can sword clash and then steal Galaxia to become Meta Knight Kirby is awesome for Kirby fans for sure. Also a nice easter egg being that the sword Meta Knight continues the fight with is his sword from Kirby's Adventure. This fight is amazing and made me so happy. Winning the Coliseum and having the Waddle Dee's cheerier victory with Commentator D is nice. The fourth area is Winter Horns, which gives a nice winter touch to the overworld song, and I swear the theme of this area is Frozen Over London. It just feels like it with all the brick houses and the Big Ben clock. The music is my favorite part of this area. Starting with Northeast Frost Street, you get these songs, and they just feel so majestic and wintry. The music rises and swells with chimes and other instruments that fit so well. The item buff store gets introduced around this time too, and it's a great addition, allowing you to go speed and power your way through the Coliseum, and the game itself is great. It is of course tempered by the fact you need to spend coins though, so there's that. Metro and Ice Stage is a fun ice stage here, it's a nice idea. What if the Metro was frozen to heck too? Yeah, that's good. After that, fishing is unlocked, and I love the fishing. It's fun to see the record was originally a little fishy caught by Waddle Dee, and then Kirby rolls in and destroys that record with bigger and bigger fish. The QT minigame of playing this is fun, and I just enjoyed it playing it a lot. Catching the 10kg fish is exciting. Windy Freezing Seas is another fun level, and continues what I like about the level designs. We saw a frozen city, then the frozen metro, so of course the docks would be frozen too. And lastly, the fourth stage of the Battle of Blizzard Bridge perfectly finishes this off. 
We can't do London without London Bridge, and since it's a bridge, what better way to handle a narrow area than another boss rush? It's probably my favorite stage from this area because of the big bridge shot at the start and because I enjoy boss rushing. King Dedede's boss fight is great. Everything about this stage is amazing. The walk up to the boss fight has great landscape shots, the little cutscene with the sad little deep pleading with his master works well, and then the fight! The music swells in the introduction of King Dedede is so good, great presentation. The first half, feeling like a traditional King Dedede fight with him doing attacks he's done over the years, and then a brand new set of big attacks in the second half. Those pillar attacks? Nice! Rora Dedede is the song playing in the background, and the fact he gets two boss fights and two themes is pretty cool, and both are good. Rora Dedede was done by Ogasawara, and then finishing the fight, he gets knocked out in the background, and it's funny, you can just beat up on King Dedede as he's knocked out. And then you do the victory screen, and King Dedede nabbing Elfoin at the victory screen was a nice surprise. You can argue there's a failing here in storytelling for anyone new to the series. Nothing at this point gives you the impression they know each other. King Dedede is just another boss for a new player. Midnight got some talk about him when the Coliseum was built, so you know he's a Dreamlander. Not so much King Dedede. Later when you get a figure, you learn more about him, and that he made some progress in the new land, but turned back to defend the Waddles. I'm talking about Metal Knight with that one. You also learned when King Dedede's that he was looking around for his Waddles and for Kirby, and got depressed when he couldn't find anyone, and then he got mind-controlled, so it sucks for King Dedede. But you only learned that from the figure if you're a new player. But of course you assumed he got possessed again, because of course he did, he's got red eyes, what else would that mean? Also because he's ignoring captive Waddle Dees, he would never do that, you would think, so yeah. This kidnapping works very well. The lack of Elphalan is felt. Instantly. You don't hear him chiming in anywhere you go. He's not there for Kirby Dance at the end. He's not there for the sleeping. He's just not there. You feel that void. They did a good job of bringing in someone you would like and then taking him away from you to make you sad. Well done. I hate you, game. <laughs> Kirby then follows King Dedede to Original or uh, Wasteland. Desert theme. I like how you get these big horns and drums for their overworld song. It's interesting seeing where they take the desert theme, by the way. Real quick, back in town, some things unlocked. Uh, first, you gotta talk to Bandana D, because he's freaking out about King Dedede. The only indication new players that King Dedede is someone from previous games. And you also unlock the Tilt and Tumble games. The Tilt and Tumble games are fun. It's great to see the motion controls utilized, the songs by Jun Ishikawa, and the hard version is pretty frantic. I like this minigame a lot, it's pretty fun. But with Elfoli missing, I didn't do any minigames until I got him back. <laughs> So Regional Wasteland, the first stage is the Waste Where Life Began. Interesting title here. One can only assume this is the area like the Old World Continent on this planet, and we just left the New World Continent of the planet. It's an interesting start, it's full of ships and shipping containers in the desert, so this must have been a dock, which makes sense since it's the first place you make landfall. The music has that Desert Arabian feel, and it's a fun area. A cool touch is having Ring Kirby blast away sand piles, making the ring not just good for water levels with boats, but also just sand. The falling pillars are a nice background the foreground touch in this level. I always enjoy that stuff. Searching the Oasis is the second level and it's an interesting one to see because it's a ruined resort in the desert. Swimming pools and other things of leisure covered in sand. The big frogs named Crocums is an intimidating sight. I like that we were first shown them as impervious enemies covered in poison, and then once we get the water balloon ability, they're made vulnerable and destroyed. The third stage, Alive Mall Stab Side, is a fun level and my favorite of this area. The opening shot is really good, it's great we get to see another Alive Mall showing it was a popular brand in this world. And the cool thing is that we get to go into the background of the Alive Mall, the staff side as the level is called. And I like the touch of the music being muffled whenever you're in the back rooms. And what I like about this level is the shape matching portion. That's a fun and creative idea. Just like in Wondaria, Kirby's adventure here takes a day and ends up at the Moonlight Canyon level at night. And Kirby finds a secret base in the desert. The music for the dark levels again by Jun Ishikawa. They really take advantage of the light and dark and make it a perilous journey as Lightbulb Kirby. Quite a few floors and such you need to pay attention to, or else you're going to be in a bad way. I really like the song when you get out. It's very reminiscent of old style anime songs. And the song is called Moonlight Canyon and it's by Shimooka. The lead up to the Silly Dillo boss fight is good. Kirby comes into this abandoned place and it looks and feels creepy. Lots of anti Kirby posters everywhere and the fake Kirby dolls in the air. Oh my god. Surprise Kirby when he sees the fake Elfland is really good. I enjoy that little scene. They also did a good job making Silly Dillo look ridiculous. But Silly Dillo is my least favorite boss. Gory Mondo is the most boring. Silly Dillo looks great. And he has some attack variety, but his fight drags out the longest. His fight has a lot of character. And all the rolling and spinning around makes you spend a lot of time on the defensive and you can't really do much to him unless you have like gun and even then it's not so much you can do. 
This fight takes forever. The only fight that takes longer is the final boss, and it's supposed to because the final boss is supposed to give you so much more. And the stakes are just bigger in the final boss, and we'll get to that eventually. So it's my least favorite boss. I just do not care for fighting Silly Dillo. I never enjoy it. It's just not great. I found that Crystal Kirby is the best way to take down Silly Dillo quickly, by the way. When you crash into a wall with a bunch of stars, you can hit him pretty fast and quick with that and just destroy him. Now, it's been a while since I've talked about a power, and since we've got them all in the game, let's talk about Spike Kirby as one of the more creative looking abilities. Spike really got a lot out of 3D. You get to roll around, and the more enemies you stick to, the faster you go. That's really all there is to that power, and it's not that interesting gameplay wise, but visually it's great. Seeing a Spike Ball impale a lot of enemies is fun. The second evolution known as Clutter Kirby is a reference to Swiss Army Kirby from Kirby 64, and I love that a lot. I love the mess of objects that bounce around with that ability. And then the final evolution of Crystal Kirby looks cool and is stronger, but that's about it. That's really it. And that's too bad. I like Spike, but there's just not much to it. So next is the second to last land, Redgar Forbidden Lands, and the intro to that song is so good. The trumpets come in hard, the music has a fieriness to it, and you know things are getting serious. The first stage is Enter the Fiery Forbidden Lands, and it starts with such a good big bang. Meteors are crashing down and you have to avoid them? That is intense. There is a lot of perils all the way to the end, which is nuts with Water Kirby as meteors come crashing down. And for a mission, you're trying to keep the meteors from crashing down. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty intense. I like that level a lot. There's one particular song that gets used a lot in this land for like three levels. And the music trails along really well. It feels like it's one instrument going against a bunch of other instruments as it's going forward. And so it gives a sense of it's following Kirby as he braves this lava filled level. This is because the song is an arrangement of both Running Through the New World and Welcome to the New World, and this song is of course done by Ando. Then you have Conquer the Inferno Road stage, which maintains the same song. It's perfect to keep this going as Kirby continues to face many adversaries going forward. You can tell Kirby is deep in enemy territory at this point. The building climb and then the skyscraper rooftop running is a lot to navigate. The gradual increase in difficulty has been pretty good, I think, and it's also nice to see how the different Malpha modes get utilized in the different lands like how Ring Kirby is used with the fans for platforming challenge and then boating in lava. At this point you max evolve guns, so let's talk about that. Your first gun is fun, you're shooting stars and you're a cute little hunter. Second form is cool with a dual pistol pirate boy with rapid fire charge, that's fun. Then third form is a cute little space ranger with a big energy ball blast. Gun and its evolutions is definitely one of the better powers in the game in visuals and in gameplay. Also nice touch with the little heads up display on his suit, it's a little star, that's cool. Also, by the way, the dodge attack is really good on this. You do a dodge roll, you get the slow-mo, and then you shoot a bunch of blasts. It's very fun. I love it a lot. Burning Churning Power Plant is the next level, and another great visual shot at the open. This place is something we need more in real life. Geothermal energy plants. We haven't had a 3D stage with crushers yet, and this stage is that. We had some conveyor belts in a live mall, but this stage takes it further. The industrial music is pretty good, too. The last part with the background to foreground walls coming at you and you need to fit the shapes, it's a nice touch, really. I love it. Gathering of the Beast Council is a great stage, probably my favorite because it's a boss rush level. The music from the first two stages is playing again and it fits since Kirby is venturing through the base. Meteors are crashing down everywhere and then you face Gory Mondo and are reminded how easy it is to beat. The Malfoy modes between the fights are fun. I really enjoy the driving pipe and roller coaster sections. Still don't enjoy Silly Dillo. Fighting Qualorine again is still fun. So it's just a little fun boss rush stage with fast mouthful sections and solid music. A solid stage. I'll mention Sleep Kirby this time. Probably the funnest power visually is Sleep Kirby. When you first suck up a naughty, Kirby looks sleepy and just passes out on the spot and it is both funny and cute. But then the surprise that you can upgrade it? Wow! Kirby whips out of bed and sleeps on the spot and gains a random buff. A very nice power in the visuals and utility. Interestingly, the next stage is called the Beast Pack's uh, Final Stand, and you would have thought the boss rush was that, but no, you're fighting everything now. I like the build-up. Kirby takes an underground elevator. We've seen so many ruined places, and basically this whole place has been ruined industrial complex, and they did it so well. This stage is everything you want in a final platforming stage. Kirby has to face off against wave after wave of enemies and increasingly more difficult and perilous platforming stages. He also used nearly every mouthful mode across the stage. There is no slow moment in this stage, and I love it for that. Everything is on the line in this stage. The music sets the stage very well, I'm saying stage a lot, but the intense music, just like the other music in Redgar. These songs are about perseverance, and that is what Kirby is. The level ending with Kirby crushing a Tortilding is pretty great too. So let's talk about another power since we're near the end. Let's talk about Cutter and Fire Kirbys. 
Carter Kirby, which evolves into Shockroom and then Buzzsaw Kirby. Shockroom is cool, it looks like the Cutter Duck grew up, while Buzzsaw is just a Buzzsaw hat that looks good. This is one of the more interesting abilities. It has close range combo, boomerang effects, and a charge up. Shockroom gets better with multiples and speed, while Buzzsaw is interesting for bouncing off walls. Solid power for taking groups and 1v1. Fire Kirby looks cooler, but has less utility. Fire looks nice, then Lava looks funny with the Lava Chunks, but then it hits maximum cool with Dragonfire Kirby. A little dragon with lots of fire is great. He's a great boss killer since the fire attack sticks to enemies and damages them over time, while Kirby can dodge and strike more. So with the Beast Pack defeated, all that's left for Kirby is to have a re -re -re rematch with King Dedede. I like the storytelling here. King Dedede has a mask on to mind control him, and he's trying to fight it, but in the end he fails and it's time to fight. King Dedede wearing a warthog mask is funny to me, by the way. It's just so silly. He's a, he's a penguin, what the heck? He also has dueling hammers and he gets a second theme called Masked and Wild DDD, and this one's by Shimaoka. I really enjoy this theme. It's a remix of Masked DDD's theme, which was my previous number one King DDD theme. Arguably, I'm splitting hairs here, but they are different. Roar of DDD is a remix of the regular DDD theme, while Wild is a remix of Masked DDD, which was a faster remix of the regular King DDD theme, so yeah. Anyway, this fight is pretty cool. We have King DDD doing lots of new moves and rushing you pretty strongly. You only really get an opening to attack when he winds up or when he gets tired after rushing you. And then there's the second form, which is fun with him going hog wild and rushing you even faster. The rushing attacks, fire tornadoes, big belly flops, and his huge sucking attack are fun to deal with. Kirby's rivals are always fun to fight. The cutscene after Kirby knocks sense into King Dedede is great. He's no longer possessed and happy to see his subjects. You can see the sadness on the Waddle Dee's faces, and then the happiness they all have once he's shown he isn't possessed anymore. King Dedede's sacrifice to save his subjects is pretty great too. It's a nice scene for fans and a great scene for newcomers. They see King Dedede was a possessed ally, and he puts his subjects ahead of himself. Also, Kirby getting bunked with Waddle Dee is funny. And immediately from there, you end up in Lab Discoveria to create the Easter egg of the first letters. Natural Plains, Everbay Coast, Wanderia Remains, Winter Horns, Original Wastes, Redgar Forbidden Lands, and now we have Lab Discoveria giving us New World with the first letters, and then Lab LD. The elevator scene is nuts since it's so rare to get dialogue in a Kirby game. The Waddles are sad and worried, and you're on rails with this elevator while this is all happening. They somehow recognize Kirby's language and give him and the Waddles a tour? It was such a great shock! By the way, the 86 in IDF 86 is an easter egg, by the way. Hal likes to use 86 and things because a pun on 86 is the name Hal, how do? The elevator builds up IDF 86, and it mentions that part of it broke away, so I just made guesses on everything. Kirby, Dark Matter, etc. Because, like, Dark Matter has this breakaway thing with Dark Matter Swordsman and Gooey, so I thought maybe something like that happened with Kirby. But no, I was wrong. At no point was I realizing it had to do with Elphalan. It made perfect sense, didn't realize it anyway. Usually you get info dumped by pause menus and such, and this time they instead did it in an elevator, which I thought was nice. It's a better accessibility thing in general, so that works out. And we see that the Waddles were actually taken from Dreamland so they could be used to power the place, which is so silly. And we eventually learned that Elfland was the one that broke away from IDF-86. It's interesting to learn that somehow this land used IDF-86 abilities to make warp technology. So of course, you're made to ask questions. Where did everyone go? Did they warp away and leave no one to care for the planet? What the heck? Another interesting thing is that the lead up to this fight only gives you half the abilities, which of course tells you that this is not the final boss, because if it was, it would have all of them there, not just half. And of course, the leader of the Beast Pack is a lion named Leon, or in this case, Leongar at the moment. And I'm fine with this info dump since it's the end of the game and he tells you a bunch of things. But what's curious is that Leon tells the player that everyone left to a land of dreams. Wouldn't it be nuts if the Waddles ran this place? If the Waddles left and went to Dreamland, wouldn't that be crazy? But because time's different, I don't think it's that, unless they've been gone from the Forgotten Land for a very long time. But I also think maybe he's talking about the Ancients. That could also be possible, but the time discrepancy makes it weird too. But that's all speculation for another video. This is a review. Still getting more lore is fun for the longtime Kirby fans. Elphalan being the good half of IDF 86 is an interesting development. For new players, this is just an interesting story. For returning players, this turns things on its head. A lot of fans were convinced Elphalan was going to betray us. But what if he's forced by being fused with a villain? It's not exactly a betrayal, but you're still fighting them. So that's interesting. By the way, I love the detail of claw marks on Leongar's dialogue window. The only problem with Leongar is he's as boring as Gorimondo, though. He has bigger attacks, but they're slow and easy to dodge. He's just a big lion guy, that's it. His first form is just boring. 
The music is epic though, but then the second form when he's possessed, now that's way more fun. Big energy attacks and rampaging bite attacks give some variety. Then of course the big breath blast, which is pretty dang cool. Back to Forgo is a great concept, and I'm sure this unsettling creature gave a bunch of kids nightmares. I like the design, but not all the execution. The background, the foreground stuff is good, but it could have amped up the tension a little more with more speed or more jump at the screen attacks. The music is great, and the sound effects. The sound of him sloshing around as he chases you is really well done. It's just not a fun sound to hear. Amps up just the creep factor for sure. And despite beating Fecto Forgo, the player had to know Elflin was going to get absorbed. The build-up to this fight is pretty good. All ten powers are available as you climb up the stairs with the quiet build-up on the rooftop fight, and oh my god. Everything from King Dedede forward is so well-crafted. As much as I don't care for Leongar, the fight is still cool-looking, and is really a warm-up for this long series of boss fights. The music swells as Elflin forms, and I really like this lead-up music. It reminds me of the lead-up to Sectonia, Builds it up perfectly. Alphalus fully forms with the sun at their back and the music kicks in and it's amazing how good the shadows look over Kirby and the rooftop. The fight is a great series of background the foreground attacks with big sweeping close range attacks on top, giving the player lots of opportunities to dodge and gain a confidence in this epic fight. Alphalus also doesn't hold back with the mix-up. In the second form they attack with beam attacks and rushdown attacks, something that will catch plenty of players off guard, that's awesome. Then second form amps up even more, with the portal attacks, sending down meteors, Elflin doing decoy heal attacks, and even more mix-ups, wow! It's all ultimately manageable though, which is important. You want to feel like you're being pressured, but you also want to be able to deal with it. I believe Elflin plays a great epic challenge for players of all skill sets. Higher skilled players will dodge the attacks easier, but they'll still have fun seeing all these attacks while lower skilled players will be riding by the seat of their pants all fight. It's great. The song of this fight is called Two Plants Approach the Roche Limit, which is a great name for what happens after you beat Alphalus. This song has become the favorite of many. I don't know if it beats out Sectonia's final battle for me yet, but it might. Yanking out Elflin was good tension, and for a minute I thought that was it. But as a longtime player, I was hoping for a big epic Malfo mode, like Halberd Robot Bot Kirby or something in Planet Robot, and I was not disappointed by what came next. By the way, Roche Limit was by Ando, the song building Elphalus' final attack is called The Fate of Two Worlds, and this one is by Shimaoka. The rest of the music going forward will be done by Ando. The final bit is incredibly over the top, and I love it. The fact Elphalus summons Popstar and tries to drop it on the Forgotten Land is incredible, and you wonder how they're gonna do it, and then it happens. 18 Wheeler Optimus Prime Kirby. So name explanation. The Roche Limit is the closest two planets can be near each other, without one yanking the other apart due to gravity fields. And that kind of causes, like, uh, the asteroid belt. Elphalus just broke that limit. The song for this segment is, of course, a combination of Invincibility, Candy, Theme, and Welcome to the New World. This is by Ando. It's called A Full Speed Farewell from the New World. And holy crap, I was going wild driving along crumbling buildings, dodging meteors, running over possessed animals, and then the last bit, a beam struggle? I wasn't expecting a beam struggle to be the last thing you do in this story, but here it is. Also really impressed with the voice actress for Kirby doing a beam struggle yell, and then Elflin doing one on top too. Anime screams. Makiko Omoto and Karumi Mamiya. Those are the voices of those two respectively. By the way, the image, all the people on Popstar are freaking out about all this must be great in your heads, right? Like, their planet is being hurtled through a portal. That's got to be crazy for them. Then you have the final cutscene, which is really well done. The music gives off the feeling of desperation as Popstar is being pulled apart since it's beyond the Roche limit. Happy to see Bandana D there, by the way, in the cutscene. The visuals are amazing here, and it's just ooh, so good. The song is called Soaring Determination, No Night is Eternal by Ando. The last couple seconds are really good. Elflin flying up and using their power to close the portal, and them saying goodbye really pulls the heartstrings. Look at that sad face. And then Kirby's sad, and Bandana D's sad, and of course we're sad. And Popstar has never looked better, by the way, in the background. So pretty. But the way it ends is perfect. Going right into the credits with pictures giving the epilogue, with Welcome to the New World playing. The main game is an absolutely satisfying experience, and it isn't even over yet. I love that. There's still the post-game, and in a game that was already in competition for best Kirby game of all time, it's exciting to realize there's more. We see Leon in an ominous thing, and so let's keep going. But before that, let's talk about three visuals I should have brought up earlier. Kirby when he rescues single Waddle Dees. It's really cute to see them spin around together and then Kirby waves at the Waddle Dee before they poof away. It's extra cute when you see it with mouthful modes. It's very funny. I just love that. 
Another visual thing is Elfling shrinking and enlarging from Kirby. It's a nice clean animation whenever we see it happen when he arrives at a place. Really good. And the last one to bring up has got to be the extremely cute Kirby waving at the camera while on their Warp Star. It's too cute, and if you have Bandana D, they wave at the camera too. It is way too good. So let's talk about Hammer Power since we unlocked it at this point when you beat the game. Wild King DDD Hammers are great. The Hammer line is almost great. Like, regular Hammer is good. Toy Hammer is beyond cute, and the sound effects are so good. And then you have Bonkers Hammer, which is okay. It's slow, it hits hard, but that's it. And then you get the double hammers, which do devastating damage. King Diddy's evolution is so good. Kirby looks hilarious in that mask and having those two hammers and does so much damage. The fire tornado bounce is so good. The spin is really good. It is an extremely powerful weapon. It is hands down one of the most powerful weapons in the game. Probably the second or first, depending on how good you are with it. Hammers are just strong. They just have no equal besides sword. So post-game gives us a new Coliseum fight, which is fun. The portal to save Leongar is there, and then you get sound test mode as well. I really enjoy how sound test was handled in this game. There's a Waddle Dee band to play all the songs? That's awesome. And it evolves as you get more stuff. The post-game poses more lore questions. The post-game is pretty good. You get to connect or learn about what happened with everyone before going back to work helping the Forgotten Land. The Leon soul areas are interesting. You look for 50 soul pieces across remixes of each land, each using a bit of each stage. The song for all these stages is called Faded Dream of a Psycho Meddler, and it's by Ando. It's a cool idea, but some of those souls are obtuse to find. It dragged a little bit trying to find them all, and I would complain about this a lot more if not for the fact Elfling tells you when you found every soul piece in an area. The newer, harder bosses are all better than the previous incarnations, but don't do much to make Gorimondo or Silly Dillo better. Gorimondo just grabs more while Silly Dillo mixes up his attack pattern a little more, and has a sandstorm, and that's it. The Gorimondo spin does look cool over the tornadoes though, I gotta give it that. What makes Wispy's fight better is the Wire Maze and the Gordos. That is a pretty cool idea right there, and I love doing that. Flower Line's clone attacks, the Fan Knife attack, and the mixed up attack pattern is very good. I like that a lot. Leongar is better in his fights as well, he's a bit faster and that makes it just better. The real awesome Phantom Boss fights though are King Diddy and Meta Knight's fights. King Diddy's first fight is better since he fights bigger and faster and nice surprise the Long Gordos. While Wild King Diddy feels like a genuinely new fight. With the implementation of lava in the fight, King Diddy does wider and bigger attacks and tilts the stage to submerge in lava. That is so cool! He generates so much fire tornadoes too and the hammer throws while doing the butt slam. So much is going on. This fight has so many new attacks. Not to mention the second form of the meteor drops. They did an amazing job with that fight. So Forgo Land needs to be mentioned. The lead up to fighting Leongar is hearing, and here we are, and here we are, and here we are, over and over again, and that's just so creepy. Nice surprise making us think we were going to skip Leongar fight with Alphalin reviving him, and they do the Kirby dance, but what makes Possessed Leon better is that he's second form from the start. Then his new second form brings in some new attacks, and they're all very easily dodgeable like first form Leongar. And then third form with Ophelis attacking at the same time is really good though, that's pretty cool, it's a nice fight. Then comes my favorite moment in the game, because they set it up and I couldn't believe it happened, Soul Forgo. Kirby has been fighting the souls of final bosses for a couple games now, and then the butterfly. They set it up in the first cutscene, we saw a butterfly get sucked into the portal, I couldn't believe it. Morphonitis Cannon! They suck up Soul Forgo, oh my god! This fight is so fun, and the song is awesome. Ogasawara got to do it this time. Fire attacks, sword combos, teleport attacks, giant sword swings, disorientation sound blasts, and so much more. Morpho Knight is an amazing fight for everyone. Love it so much. I have loved Morpho Knight since Kirby Star Allies, and the fact they're canon before Galactic Knight is amazing. <laughs> then surprise, that's the end of the game for the second time. I honestly thought they were going to just have Leon be dead at the end. More credits to give story summary and epilogue, and then the third to last shot showing Kirby going to the Coliseum and being teased with Soul Elfless. So good. Beating Morphonite unlocks his sword, so let's finally talk about sword and evolutions. Sword has all of its attacks, making it pretty much the bread and butter weapon for Kirby. Gigan Sword is fun and strong, and gotta love Kirby's Wild Edge helmet. It also gets a shield. Then it's hilarious seeing Meta Knight Kirby, and how strong the sword is at full HP. Even better is Morphonite Sword, which is similar but can be charged up like Gagan's sword to become a huge sword. Also, it has lifesteal, making it probably the best weapon in the game. 
The Morphinite suit is broken, and it's great seeing Kirby dressed up as them. I love them in that outfit. So the last thing to talk about, of course, is Ultimate Cup Z and anything left after that. The Ultimate Cup Z is a fun challenge to get through. An extra hard boss rush mode made up of all the phantoms, including Phantom Meta Knight. Phantom Meta Knight is so much fun. His attacks are bigger, faster, and more wild, and it's so much fun to fight him. And the final, final boss fight, Chaos Elfless, is amazing. The build-up to the locker room is so creepy. The title reveal shot is probably my favorite shot in the game. It is so clean, so well-timed, and the music goes with it. Chaos Elfless just looks perfect in that shot. A great mix of white, red, and black, and so many new attacks on top of the old attacks. Tons of mix-up to make it harder. And wow, does the fight feel epic. Of course, my favorite attack is the Portal Beam attack. Then after all that, you have to fight their pure soul, and the music gets crazier in the Black Hole attacks. Lots of lasers, falling rubble, meteor rushes, blood rain, and so much more. A satisfying final, final, final boss. Seeing Elflin become one with himself after Kirby beat Elflin into submission is great. And after all that, you finally unlock a Waddle Dee who can trade the pieces you don't have, which I think is a smart addition to the game. Ultimately, they give you everything you need to achieve 100% in this game. You can buy buffs, you can upgrade the heck out of Morphinite Sword, you can always go back to Spring Breeze difficulty. Elflin tells you you've got all of Leon's soul in an area, which is very important. Wise D gives you hints for a blueprints, you can retake the Coliseum at the round you lose, and there's a Collector D to trade for figurines. Great accessibilities for all levels of players. So, last things to say in case I didn't say them earlier. The evolution of Waddle D Town is nice, the storytelling of a real world by what you see as you run around it is well done, and I love all the Waddle Ds we got. And here we are, finally done going over the whole dang game. Talking about what was great and what was not so great about the game, honestly, most of my complaints are nitpicks aside from having no instructions on abilities and the low number of abilities. This game was amazing, I felt absolute satisfaction from playing the game, and not a single secondary regret. So with all this goodwill, it definitely overpowers the few complaints. But still, I should summarize things in good and bad, so... TLDR versions, the good! The OST and sound effects are top-notch, amazing. Visuals are great, a very colorful and vibrant game. Gameplay is fun. They did a good job translating Kirby to 3D, and most boss fights were a creative joy to fight. Evolutions and Malfa mode are a great addition to the game. The final battle was beyond epic, all the final battles. Cutscenes were very well done, and the presentation of the game in general was very fun. Waddle D Town is a wonderful hub, and I like that we can learn the lore of the world through figures and the background instead of pausing screens, which breaks up the action. This game is easily accessible to new and old players alike. Nothing hinges on you needing to know who old characters are, but there's easter eggs for old players. A completely satisfying game to play and complete to 100%, never dragged for me be outside of uh, certain boss fights. The bad! There could be more abilities in some of the bosses least only can be desired. Also, the movesets for the powers we do have are lacking in some ways. Evolutions are cool and make up for some of these deficiencies. It's also really weird that they don't give any way to know the full moveset. I'm still discovering attacks I didn't know about. When it comes to accessibility, that's a bad thing. So the question becomes, is 10 out of 10 perfection? You could define it that way, but if 10 out of 10 means perfection, then no game could possibly get 10 out of 10. Everyone's favorite game has something to nitpick about it, or some little flaw. In the end, I have my complaints, but they don't hamper how amazing the game was, so 10 out of 10 for sure. Wow, this was a lot to talk about, and this was a review mostly summarizing the game. When we finally return to this game in a couple years in the podcast, after covering all the other games in full detail, this is going to be a very long video slash podcast episode. Oh my god. So that is everything for this uh, episode. Are there anything great or bad about the game that I didn't think of? Let me know in the comments of the YouTube version or comment to me through tweets at Kirby Dreamcast on Twitter. I'm really happy this game came out. What an amazing way to celebrate Kirby's 30th birthday. I can't wait to see what comes next. If you got to the end of this gigantic episode, you should totally follow subscribe to us on everything. I had fun, I hope you had fun too, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? Having fun. Thanks for coming by, and see you next time.